It has been meditated upon, argued and fought over for thousands of years. Hinduism is the world's oldest faith and it brings together within it everything from the most soulful contemplation to the most boisterous rituals. Just under 80% of Indians define themselves as Hindus. India has been a majority Hindu country and the world's most diverse and plural nation for a very long time. But what does Hinduism really mean today? Can it address our deepest anxieties and our most pressing questions? Does it divide or does it unite? I will ask all those questions to some of the finest minds in the world in this very special series called Being Hindu. I'm Hindul Sen Gupta and we are discussing this special 12 part series on my new book Being Hindu. I'm absolutely privileged to have as the first guest so to speak of the series. I'm delighted to have Meghna Desai. Why is Hinduism to you relevant in the 21st century? You know, I think, I think of Hinduism, uh, you know, as an object of study, let's put it that way. I'm, I'm a Hindu atheist. One can only be an atheist relative to a religion, you can't be just... A, and I mean, it, is, it is surprising that something which is as diffuse as this, one thing, something which lacks a church and a creed and a book, which religions are supposed to have, has lasted as long as it has done. It is one of the oldest religions as we, we have record of. And it mutates. It's an amazing capacity for mutation. And in a sense, uh, I mean, we, we'll probably come back to this later on. It is like a shopping mall. It's a huge shopping mall. So that different people get different things out of something called Hinduism. It satisfies their hunger for belief, for faith, what you call it. And the person next door may have a completely different uh, Hinduism, but it all coexists. One of the reasons why I argue in being Hindu, why Hinduism remains relevant, is the point taking off from what you just mentioned, the ability to mutate. Mm. But some people would also argue, and it's one of the, my corollary arguments in the book, that while there is a lot of mutation, some of the core principles remain the same. Christopher Isherwood, yeah. you know, talks about these core principles, uh, the fundamental of which is this belief that the truth must remain the same, no matter what path through which you approach the truth. Uh, do you think that is even a valid concept in a world torn apart by so much strife, so much uh, belief that individualistic paths in some senses lead to different truths? You know, I think I, I think in different ways because <clears throat> there is a Hinduism of the thinking mm. people. People who think, like you and Christopher Isherwood, want a thought-satisfying Hinduism. They want Hinduism as path to truth, different paths to truth. Mm. And there, I think it's not so that you get to truth, but there are different ways of getting to truth. The plurality is more interesting than the destination, mm. because, you know. Uh, now, you know, when I was reading your book, uh, which is a very, very good book, incidentally, I was thinking of my mother. Mm. You know, my mother just would have nothing in her Hinduism which relates to you, mm. your book. Mm. Okay, but the variety, especially women. You know, I think there's a, 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 a whole thing about women and men, about uh, Hinduism, uh, because women, you know, what I, let me call it popular Hinduism. Mm. What is popular? Popular Hinduism is going to the temple or having a little uh, shrine at home, doing the daily puja, doing this thing, perhaps making a contract with God that if you do such and such, I'll fast, you know, I will worship. Or, the, you know, when you go to Tirupati, as I have been, the amazing amount of hardship people have gone through 
to just visit Tirupati. They have taken a while, they have walked there or they waited 10 years. And what do they get? They, get? they are in this line and they get a glimpse of the deity. Mm. The darshan, so to speak. Yeah, the darshan. The darshan. Yeah. Now, in a sense, this one, you know, I've been through that, so I, I sort of passed quickly. I wanted to give a few seconds to the next people. You know, the fact that people get this amazing fulfillment mm. from going to uh, Tirupati or to going to Shirdi Sai Baba or whatever it is, or my mother who, who never went to any of this thing, but every day she had a little litho print of Kali in the home and she worshipped every day. And her faith was no less than anybody else's faith. Mm. And it was also very rewarding for her to be able to believe. Now, you know, I think that the great thing about Hinduism is that you have these different different floors you can stop at. But do you think the understanding, the Advaitic understanding of truth being sublime and omniscient and omnipresent and so on and so forth, in, in some senses correlates at a very deep level to the Hinduism, for instance, that your mother followed? If you look at the history of Hinduism, yeah. uh, you, you begin with the, the Vedas, hmm. and, and we don't worship the gods of the Vedas. We don't worship Indra, Agni, Maruts, and all that. And the lovely hymns and so on. Then we get Advaita, you get Upanishads and you know, Ved, Vedanta and so on. And then you suddenly get Bhakti. Hmm. You see, what really happens is round about the beginning of the Christian millennium, 200 sides on either yes. side, we suddenly get Bhakti. Uh, Bhakti, uh, Shiva and Vishnu and Kali. And this, you know, we are still trying to understand precisely when this happens and so on. But if you say in the, in the Gita analogy, uh, the Vedanta is the Jnana Yoga. Mm. Mm. This is Bhakti Yoga. That's right. You know, and there's mm. Karma Yoga. And so for my mother it was Bhakti Yoga. Yes. My mother wanted an uncomplicated one-to-one -one relationship with Kali. Mm. or Amba, as she, she would call it. And she had one to one Amba. It did not preclude relationship with Vishnu or Lakshmi or she, whatever it is. But she wanted her god, her goddess was. Now, in a sense, that intense one to one relationship mm. with God, with a God, with a God. And yes, maybe there is background that is this, uh, this higher Hinduism. Uh, but in a sense, that's not the point. Mm. You see, in a sense, the search for truth is a philosophical search. Mm. The search for liberation is a different kind of thing. Mm. And it, my mother may not even know about liberation, but she wanted to make quite sure that while she lived, her faith in Kali and Amba was conveyed to Amba. I, actually, your, your book made me think about it. Because as I was reading your book, I said, yes, I, I agree with this, it's very interesting. Uh, and about the, both, the, both the old age of Hinduism and its modernity, mm. which, mm. which you combine very well. Mm. And I thought, yes, of course this is all true and, and you know, very well stated. But uh, what about my mother? Uh, so I just, I just suddenly thought of my mother and, I thought, and, and my visit to Tirupati and so on. And I thought, there is no necessary contradiction between them because, is, yeah. because Hinduism is a is a, the building of many floors. Or, or, but in a sense, whether somewhere at the back of my mother's mind there was this thing or not, I don't know. Mm. Because you see, even in uh, Indian history, mm. the debate about Advaita and so on gets revived in late 19th century, early yes. 20th century, as part of the nationalist effort. Mm. And especially after independence, people like Radha Krishna wanted to equip the new middle classes with their little religion and that, that, that became, uh, you know, Advaita Vivekananda, and the Bhagavad Gita and so on. Uh, I don't think my mother ever read the Bhagavad Gita. Uh, and uh, nor did my father. But interesting, I think, you know, so we, while we, while we, respect and study and tell the world about Advaita. You must not forget that a lot and lots of people, Hinduism is 
like daily bread. Is Hinduism today equipped to deal with the challenges that it faces? For instance, do you think caste is something, a, a conversation that Hinduism is having with any sense of adequacy? Are we having a good conversation about caste? Are we having a good conversation, and we'll come to the uh, question after that, are we having a good conversation about Hinduism and other faiths? Yeah. Its engagement with Christianity, even more importantly, its engagement with Islam. Yeah. You know, in a sense, because there is no, there is no Vatican. Yes. And there is no Pope. Yes. Okay, there is no Hinduism. Mm. To have a conversation. There are Hindus who can have a conversation. Mm. Sometimes there... So the ism can't have a yeah, conversation. There are, there are governments with, with a majority Hindu ministers who maybe believe more than the other ministers. Uh, or political party like the Bharatiya Janata Party which is Hinduism in part of its political philosophy. Sure. Its whole approach to the people has, you know, whether they display it or not, it is known that these guys have a greater commitment to Hinduism than in other parties. Mm. They can have a conversation. Mm. But then it's a conversation is peculiar because the connection between the religion and the society mm. is not completely articulated. Mm. You know, you have a lot of people arguing that, oh, you know, caste was never meant to be part of it, never in I mean, I, for instance, uh, you know, I don't accept a caste identity. Yeah. I never took the sacred thread, but I'm a practicing Hindu. Sure. Now, the question that I often grapple with is, does that make me, does, is, is that then the liberation of Hinduism? That I can say, I dis, you know, I disregard what my caste see, identity that, that, that is? That is the ability of Hinduism to modernize itself. Hmm. You know, I also don't have a sacred thread. Yes. I was not even taught the Gayatri That's by, by, by my father. Nor I mean, you know, you know, so, you know, all these people going on about the Gayatri, the whole wow, you know. So, you know. I and, mean, the East and, Gayatri is not very big. Yeah, you know, and, and it, was, it, it, it was, I, I was never, you see, I was never an apostate. You can't be an apostate in Hinduism. That's right. Yes, it's impossible to be an apostate. Yeah, an apostate right? Right. Yeah. So, in a sense, from that point of view, Hinduism accommodates to your your lapses or non mm. non performance of religious acts mm. or religious symbols but you know a sacred thread is not a religious thing it's a social thing mm. you see caste is not a necessary part of religion and the manusmriti is not a religious book yeah i mean, I mean if anybody wants to read it yeah. no i think the, the thing is the social structure and its evolution had to have a was claimed to have a religious sanction because there were not enough Hindu states to mm. enforce caste. Mm. You see, the one of most, another peculiarity, one of the great property of uh, India, not so much of Hindu, but India, is that despite the weakness of the political state, the society survived. Mm. The mm. society survived so much intact that even hundred years of Muslim, of a thousand years of Muslim or whatever it was, never disturb the caste system. Mm. On the other I hand, mean, in fact, Muslim, many Muslim Muslim communities Muslim, yeah, Muslims acquired the caste adopted system. Caste. Exactly. As yeah, did the yeah, Christians. Yeah, exactly. I mean, even the Syrian yeah, Christians yeah. in Kerala have a... And, and yeah. so you, you, you mutated from a Varna system to Jati system yeah. and all that. And you know, modernity will require dealing with the hierarchical caste system. Mm. And I think a lot of political pressures in India mm. have really... A, arisen from confronting the caste system and its problems mm. uh, because the whole reservation, the whole SC, SC, ST debate, the reservation debate and all that is basically the a hierarchical social system is incompatible with the democratic polity. Do you think it's weaker than ever before? Do you think the caste I mean, question oh, is weaker than ever before? I mean, it is weakening day by day. It is weakening day by day. I mean, in, in a sense, just the whole thing, uh, thing of Rohit Vemula. Yes. Uh, you know, in a sense, the story behind the story is that his uh, upper caste teachers mm. were displeased that he had got as far as he didn't know. Mm. Who is he to have got that far? But I also have said publicly, so I can say it here again, that the fact that we had an OBC Prime Minister who has for the first time been legitimately elected, is offending a lot of people. They will say they don't like him because he's a communalist or whatever it is. They don't like him with the OBC. 
Now, if you say that, people do not know, it can't be like that. But it's very deep in us. But this is not adequately studied, isn't it, Dr. No, Desai? The, yeah. the caste response to Narendra Modi. Yeah, and not, not adequately studied because, you know, we, we think too much about him. But, and I've, I've, uh, yeah. there's a story I can tell you that within the foreign service, yeah. I read about this, yeah. that one foreign service official, senior, said to another one, I'm going to meet this new recruit. Do you know his caste? Because unless I know his caste, I don't know how to behave towards him. So in some ways, and this is Deep hidden dream. from the modern liberal India, some way there is still the feeling, oh, is this guy my equal socially? Mm. How should I treat him? Mm. Can I drink his water? Uh, as it were? And, you know, can I drink water with him? So I think we have, to, and I think modernity, modernization, modernization plus democracy, mm will finally remove it, but it'll take a long time. Because the other conversation, apart from caste, is that not Hinduism, as you'd clarified, but the conversations Hindus are having with other faiths, yeah. in particular Islam and of course also Christianity. Mm. What kind of conversation are we having and where do you think it's leading us? It, that conversation is much more filtered by history. Yeah. The history of nationalism. Yes none of anything else. And you know, basically, this is a great unanswered question of India. Uh, what makes India a nation? Mm. And a variety of answers have been given in the mm. past. Uh, one of them, you know, no doubt, one of them was that India is a Hindu nation, which was mm. sort of 19th century uh, construction of mm. uh, the thing by the Adan Saraswati and various people was that this is a Hindu nation. And, uh, you know, you, you, you have similar sort of response uh, 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 from, uh, from that is the, the early Muslim reform, reformism, uh, that, uh, yes, there, are the, there is a Hindu nation, there is a Muslim nation. I mean, way before Jinnah said it, you know, it was said. Now, at that time, it, you see, once you have democracy mm. threatened or promised, numbers become important. Mm. If there is no democracy, numbers are not important. Mm. You see, if you have a kingdom, mm. everybody owes allegiance to the king. And numbers don't matter. It's who king favors and so on. Once you say, oh, we're going to have voting, then say, hang on. Who's the what numbers? Yeah. And at yeah. that stage, the consolidation. I mean, Gandhiji's debate with the, Gandhiji's negotiations with Ambedkar were nothing to do with the with the caste question, mm. it is a political uh, program of concentrating all non-Muslim votes under one banner. And so he very much wanted the Dalits to stay in the fold and not outside the fold. Now, Which know, is essentially the BJP project today. We, I mean, we, it's we, also we, the RSS we, project we, to it's say It's everybody's project, you know. Yeah. Kanshiram, Kanshiram started that. Yes. So it's everybody's project. So in a sense, um, uh, the Hindu-Muslim question in India, mm. both pre and post independence, mm. has got filtered through the nationalism question. Yeah. And so the faith question is separate from the nationalism question. Mm. See, the faith question is being asked around the world. Mm. The challenge of other faiths to, to meet the crisis in Islam, as mm. I call it. Mm. I think with Islam, Islamic societies mm. are going through a profound crisis yes. of modernity. And for various reasons, uh, which I've not got time to go into. And in a, in UK, Christians and Jews are trying to get multi-faith dialogue with, the, with, with, with Muslims and so on and so forth. Now, so the faith question is now shot through by the political question of terrorism or uh, nationalism and so on. And that is, a, that is in a sense, I don't want to say more difficult here than there, but it is more persistent in India than anywhere else. Mm -hmm. Because the whole partition and all that means that question will always have to be dealt with. Mm -hmm. Partly on the grounds of faith, where I think there are not many differences, mm -hmm. because Hinduism is such a broad church thing, you, you can do it. But partly the grounds of politics and nationalism. Mm -hmm. Can we assure the Muslim community in India that they are as much part of India as everybody else. Mm, mm. And in a sense, we thought it was answered. But that question will never be permanently answered. 
that question has to be again and again answered. But the Hindu-Muslim question is still being asked. We thought the Muslim question had been settled, but it is not settled. Mm. Because in a sense, the partition is what one might call a birthmark mm. of India. Mm. And Congress had this, uh, what I would call, um, uh, convenient forgetfulness. Mm. You know, about who caused the partition. Mm. Mm. But it was, you know, for, for a lot of mm. people, that is a, that is a deep uh, birthmark wound. And we just have to say it will take a lot of patience, a lot of time, time yes. both to correct the political uh, problem and at the same time, the social inequalities that the Muslims suffer. Mm. You know, just being friendly to Muslims is not enough. You have to do something about social inequalities. And one of the critiques of the previous regime is that they may have been friendly, but they didn't actually help Absolutely. economically. Mm. So, you know, so... But what does that mean for the Hindus then? What does it mean to be Hindu today in India and engage with this question? Where does one stand? Where do you stand? I know you think of yourself as a Hindu atheist, but where do you stand or where does one stand in this question? Is it, the thing about a Hindu is that there is no any doubt that a country belongs to him. Or her. Mm. You see, the Hindu is without doubt mm. an Indian. Mm. Okay? Mm. The questions we are raising is about non Hindu minorities. Mm. Because somehow one version of nationalism links it to religion. Mm. Other versions of nationalism are, are other. That's but right. You can't, you can't ignore the religious version of nationalism, especially after the way the question of partition was mm. posed. Mm. The question of partition was posed like that, you know, and, and ultimately, it's an unanswered what, question what, of whatever one may say, people signed up to that. Congress signed up to that. Uh, you know, whether they may have liked it or not, they signed up to that. And therefore, one constant effort in India would be to again and again deal with that question. Yes. In as creative and friendly way as possible. As possible, yes. And it is a test of the political system. That a political system is generated. I mean, in a sense, the robustness of Indian democracy lies in great hope that it will be done. Mm. It will never be fully settled, but it will all be done. Mm. I mean, in a sense, it is like the race question in America. I have one final question for you. My final question is being a Hindu today, in an age of unprecedented technological advance, some would say psyche bending technological advance and in a deeply conflict-ridden world, what does it mean to be Hindu today, in today's age, in, in our time? Well, I think what it has always meant, which is you have a, a private hookup mm. with the divinity of your choice. Mm. And the divinity of your choice and you will go on having mm. a relationship with each other and everybody else would be like that. And you may or may not be in the same place, but you're all geared up with your, with your earphones and, your, and nobody else need be there. Mm. You don't need a temple, you don't need a book, you, know, you just need your own private connection. And that means you can, you, can, you can be anywhere around the world, you can be in flight, you can be in, and you can still be a Hindu practically anytime you want to be. And isn't that, to you, it does, it does that give you a sense of liberation? No, because it, finally it, the Hindu answer is, is there li going to be liberation? What, what, what or the Hindu question is, is there yeah. going to be liberation? Well, you know, since I'm not interested in liberation. <laughs> what, what, it, what, it, what it tells me is that, uh, how do I understand how this very modern thing actually come about? Yes. To me, it's an intellectual question. Mm. I know it is there. And it's a miracle that it has been this adaptable, mm. uh, so on. And maybe one of the advantages has been that there's never been a book. Ah, mm. It is not a religion of the book. Mm. So you don't have to renew the book or, or modernize it or challenge it. And the whole, whole debate of Darwinism and Christianity. Yes, yes. Painful, actually. Mm. Uh, but, you know, uh, it, it's still alive in, 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 in American South. I mean, it's not gone away. Or, or the, the yeah. Quran or whatever it is. You know, hey, you don't have a book. Yes. So you know, we, 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 we have a thousand books. So, pick and choose. I'm glad you liked my book, though. I liked your book. I liked your book. Maybe people should not choose any other book but your book. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Desai, for your time. I really appreciate Thank you it. Thank much. you very much.